Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, guys, I am your host, Butch Theory, here again this week. And before we jump into the report, we got a really cool opportunity for you. We have partnered with AFCO, and they are offering all of our listeners a free sun protection mask with any purchase of AFCO products. They make a ton of great products for all types of anglers. All you have to do to get the coupon code is text the word FISHING to 314 314- 665-1767. Again, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767 to subscribe to our email list and we'll send you the promo code via email. All right, folks, we have a great Alabama saltwater fishing report lined up for you this week. But first, let's see who's making the show possible. This week's Alabama saltwater fishing report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have Atco, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five-star Yamaha and Mercury mechanics. Also, if you're looking for a street legal electric golf cart, go check out their Atric golf carts. Sportsman's Marine on Highway 98, and they also have a downtown location next to Mr. Gene's Beans in Fairhope, Alabama. And also brought to you by Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. Photonist Defense is proud to offer the PD Pro line of night vision systems. The PD Pro series is the world's smallest and lightest night vision goggles built around the Photonist 16 millimeter filmless 4G image intensifier tubes in their hybrid filmless 18 millimeter image intensifier tubes. These ultra light, ultra compact night vision systems deliver cleanest images, best resolution, smallest, most transparent halo and best overall performance and function of any night vision system available. The PDR Pro line consists of the PD Pro M 16 millimeter monocular, the PD Pro B 16 millimeter binocular, and the PD Pro Q panoramic night vision system. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. All right, guys, welcome back to the Alabama Saltwater Weekly Fishing Report podcast. I am your host, Butch Theory, and I am joined today with Captain Patrick Garmison as my sidekick. And before we get our report for the day, joining us on the special segment, we're going to be talking to Zach McAllister and Julian Irwin of Salt's Gone. Captain Patrick, Joe and I were walking around ICAST, and I knew that you had been working with these guys with this product, and you were a big advocate of it. So I was really excited about this segment today. Yeah, man. I actually heard Zach on the Tom Rowland podcast, and and I think I was listening to the Tom Rowland podcast on the way back to the boat shed to wash my boat. And <laughs> That's he, good timing. <laughs> and he and he hit he hit he hit some key points in that interview with Tom that I realized that I was not boat washing properly and not maintaining this you know I spent a lot of money on boats and equipment and all this stuff so it it really hit home for me and I gave Zach a call or or shot him an email or something got got set up with him and got some product in in my hands and. I don't know. I feel like I'm lost. I don't if I don't have some of it on my own on hand to be able to rinse the boat off and get get things started in the right direction now. So, yep, that's great, man. That was perfect timing whenever you reached out to me and said, man, you got to try this stuff. And I feel like it was perfect timing whenever I ran into Zach and Julian at ICAST. And I, I, I just bought the first boat that I've ever cared about, truthfully. And so I'm, I'm figuring out how to care for it myself as well so zach and julian welcome to the show thanks for joining us today uh zach we'll start with you man just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in this salt gone thing sure so i've been in the corrosion industry now for about 15 years uh a lot of it dealing with you know heavy industrial corrosion we're out of houston and so uh to make a long story you know indefinite if you are Shell oil, if you're Elon Musk, if you're a guy trying to clean their boat in the backyard, y'all know most the same amount about corrosion. You just know that it exists and you know that it's a problem. And a lot of people, you know, they just kind of know the general idea of, you know, hey, I just need to get it off of there. Uh, But most people don't understand the science behind it. And so after spending so many years in the corrosion industry, you know, we really needed a product for our customers that like, hey guys, you just need to be able to get the salt off to extend the life of the coatings, to extend the life of the equipment. And um, it just so happens that the parameters that we kind of made the product to ended up being a perfect fit 
uh, in the consumer world for stuff like boats, where it's totally safe, it's easy to use, but it's 100% effective, right? It's meant for a paint inspector to come behind it and, you know, test the quality of the results. So uh, it's been a super fun product. I'll tell you, uh, what is not fun is being part of a three to five year paint study. Uh, what is fun is uh, getting out on <laughs> on everybody's boat, you know, and being a part of this world for sure. Yeah, I would think testing uh, paint on boats is way more fun than somewhere in an industrial <laughs> setting for sure. <laughs> well, how about you, Julian? Tell us a little bit about how, how you fit into this equation. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, I'm definitely not in the uh, boat. Uh, paint testing part of this, but I grew up in South Florida. I've been just fishing since I was a little kid, did some guides and stuff young, but I've basically been an airline pilot for about the last 40 years, you know, corporate aviation with the airlines. And in the mid nineties, uh, really downturn in the business. And I bought and ran a charter boat to keys full time for about three and a half years and started using some other products back then, but they were really kind of designed as uh, motor flushes. And I was having some trouble with some of my gear. So when I met Zach uh, with this product, there was a little, I was a little leery. Do I want to put this on rods and reels and stuff like that? And like Zach said, most people don't uh, understand the science. Most products are using an acid to dissolve the salt. And our niche is we're doing it a totally different way where it's a totally new pH. You can put it on anything, especially like your ceramic coating, uh, any of your decks. Uh, my department is taking it into the airplane world. The airplane world has a big issue with uh, corrosion. And today we were just talking to two of the biggest uh, airplane manufacturers in the country. So like Zach said, this product, you can really use it anywhere. But I, you know, I, have, I just love to fish and hunt so much. This is kind of my favorite part of it myself. But I got into it just because I was using the product, fell in love with it. Zach and I are just really good friends. And I said, I've only got a couple of years left in the flying business and I wanted to get involved. So we've just been having a good time as partners doing this together. Very cool story, guys. Well, like I said, thanks for joining us today. And let's go back to the kind of the beginning in the in the grassroots of this thing. Zach, what is a corrosion inhibitor? You know, before you can really uh, dive into what is a corrosion inhibitor, you got to understand, uh, particularly with salt, what it's doing. So to really make it a super short story, uh, when sodium and chlorine come together, they are actually very unstable. So they come together really easily. And that's why salt is, you know, if it's not the, the most common mineral on the planet, it's got to be like number two, right? Got to be. But what happens is the, uh, the bond is actually unstable and there's a really strong desire for electrons. And so what that means is when the salt lands on something, it wants to pull the electrons out of it, right? It's trying to satisfy its bond. Well, uh, conveniently for the salt, everything is made out of electrons, right? Like the, the glue that holds your metal together, if you would, is the electrons. And so what happens is those electrons are pulled out. And that's what we see as rust, right? That, that the visual cue is the corrosion. And so what corrosion inhibitors are doing is they're essentially providing copious amounts of electrons so that as the salt lands back on the surface, it has something to attack, right? You're not going to stop the salt from doing what, it's, what it does on the inhibiting side. You know, you need to give it what it's looking for. Does, does that make sense? So you're, you're constantly feeding it kind of what it wants. And when it has what it wants, it's never going to attack the metal on the boat. Very interesting stuff. So as I mentioned, I have a vessel that I'm, I'm trying to care for as, as good as possible now that I like this thing. And it was kept in a great climate controlled environment before. And now it's sitting outside on a salty lift. And so I'm, I'm extra. I've been trying to be extra careful about it. Do they only work before corrosion begins? Or will they aid in stopping corrosion once it has started? Kind of give us the breakdown there. Yeah. So salt's gone. It is a product that you're going to use regularly, right? So you take the boat out, it gets salty, you use the product. So it's doing a couple things. One, we're instantly removing the salt, right? So we, we want to get rid of the catalyst. Then what the corrosion inhibitors are going to do is provide you that barrier so that as the new salt lands on the surface, you've got something to protect it. And so, you know, as far as uh, will it work with existing rust, we don't pitch it this way, right? So here's the, the fun little known fact, but if you took a rusty nail and you stuck it in salt's gone overnight, uh, it wouldn't be rusty in the morning. 
So those electrons that we were talking about, when those electrons leave, we see is rust. When those electrons return, you see metal, right? So corrosion inhibitors in our case can reverse the effects of corrosion. Now that's going to be with repeated use. You're not going to spray it on there one time and the, all the rust on your trailer is going to go away. Or if you got a three inch hole in there, it's not going to go away. So <laughs> right. not to be misconstrued, <laughs> right? But, the, but metal, it goes both ways. The metal can begin to rebuild itself when it's resupplied with what it lost, which is those electrons. So Zach, what are, uh, what are the benefits of using corrosion inhibitors or just spraying the boat off with fresh water? And the reason I'm asking this question is because that was the point that I heard that stood out to me in your, in your interview with Tom Rowland was I was always under the impression or always thinking that if I jumped up in the boat with fresh water, I wash the salt off, I'm good. So tell our listeners why, why I wasn't as good as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, the, this is the number one thing that you hear, right? Water dissolves salt. Water removes salt. And, you know, the question I always ask people is like, all right, cool, man. How would you get the salt on your boat? They're like, well, I was out in the water and, you know, okay so how exactly does water d remove salt right water moves salt uh, but it doesn't remove it and so what happens as we're you know spraying off the deck of the boat every little crack crevice the you're you're kind of forcing the salt behind there the reality that you know somewhere that you have an eye hook you're going to get enough water behind there to get all the salt out is a very limited amount of reality, right? So what salt's gone is doing is it's providing a chemical aid. If the water could get there, the salt's gone could get there, right? Because they're spraying everything down. And now we have a chemical aid to remove it. You know, it'd be like, imagine washing Thanksgiving dinner with just running water. You know, the Dawn soap really gives you a, a bit of an advantage. A little right? leg up, you know, right. it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit of a leg up. And so, you know, when you're washing your boat with just fresh water, it's kind of like just using Dawn soap on your Thanksgiving dishes. Uh, you might get there, you know, but you're just not going to get there quite as easily, quite as quickly, and you're not going to do as well of a job. Definitely makes sense. So I'm picturing this thing. I have a small tower on my boat. It's powder coated. So I'm just, I mean, it's a, uh, there's several, I know there's several different applications that you guys have for this stuff, but the one that I'm familiar with, most familiar with is you screw it onto a hose, correct? Yeah, the hose end sprayers are our most popular ready-to-use packaging. They contain 32 ounces of product. You hook your garden hose up to it, probably just like you've used something to spray, you know, weed killer on your yard or something like that. It's the same packaging. And when you turn it on, you know, you have product mixing with water on its way out. Uh, now, those are just made for us, so it's mixing the product. It's a 1 to 100 ratio. Uh, they got a nice wide spray pattern on them. You got pressure from the hose, but it's certainly not like a pressure washer. So like, you know, the people that are afraid for their reels and those types of things, it's not like so powerful. And then it's easily refilled. But what's really unique about the packaging, and this is kind of like my own personal pet peeves about, you know, foam cannons and other delivery methods, you know, that are out there, is that the water is never mixing with the product until it's coming out the nozzle. So when you are finished with the hose end sprayer, that bottle is empty. So from the bow to the stern, you're getting the exact same amount of product out the entire time. Uh, what I kind of always hate about some solutions is, you know, the water's constantly mixing in there. And so it works good in the beginning. And then, you know, you're kind of like, oh, man, how blue is blue? Like, do I still have enough in here? Is it is it still working? And the hose end sprayers alleviate that. So they really make it, you know, a pretty idiot proof product, right? If you got something in the bottle, it's going to proportion out to the right amount. When the bottle's empty, just go ahead and refill it. Very, very easy for people to use. That's what I, that's what I need yeah. for sure. Yeah. We have bigger stuff, you know, so, you know, if you're a charter guy and you got three 42 foot Freemans, you know, yeah, you might want a wash station box, right? you know, where it's permanently mounted on the wall and you're just going to be able to, 
uh, turn it on and off with a wireless remote. You know, you might want something a little more high tech for a bigger boat. But, you know, if you're just running around the bay, you know, and not using it absolutely every day, the hose end sprayer is it's just an ideal product. Well, and I was going to say that people want to kind of have an idea of what they're going to get out of that product or what out of that, you know, out of that one bottle. I typically, the way I wash my boat is I'll fire up the salt scone sprayer and I'll just start at the stern. I'll work, I'll work my way down. I'm hitting the trailer, the trailer wheels, the, you know, the brakes, all of that stuff, the outside of the boat, all over the top side. I'm leaving all my rod and reels in the rod holders and stuff. So I'm hitting all of the rod holder or all the rods and I'm getting probably about six washings out of that one bottle. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm thoroughly covering everything. So for our listeners, that, that one bottle is getting me about basically a week's worth of, uh, you know, because I'm on the water five, six, seven days a week. So I'm getting pretty much a week's worth out of one bottle. So that's awesome. And if it's taking all that salts off and preventing corrosion, then man, that's how can you beat that? Plus all my, equipment. all your equipment. Yeah. I was gonna say, I'm kind of spoiled. So I live right on the water. I've got a 24 pass liner in my backyard and I have the dock box and I tell guys, you know, I buy it like five gallons at a time. I kind of hide it in the box, goes right up in there, man. It just makes it so quick and easy. And over time I've actually kind of saving money. It's kind of like a power pole, though. The first time you're going, man, am I going to spend this amount of money for a power pole? I can pull my anchor. Once you got that, it just spoils you. It just makes things so much easier to use. And I was going to add one thing to what Zach was saying. Uh, we were talking over before the show, but back in the 90s when I was using some of the products, they were an acid base. I would put some of the products on my reels, and there were two things happening. One, the acid, it would dissolve the salt. But over time, it would kind of etch my drags and the coatings on my rods and stuff. And the other thing would happen uh, is those products actually eat the grease and the protection that you have on your rods and reels, like corrosion X and stuff we use on our engines. We don't emulsify any of that oil. So any protection you have on your rods and reels, it's going to stay there. And uh, same thing with your oil-based protections on your engines and stuff like that. Um, it really protects that. Uh, like I said, that you know, my drags would get kind of grabby. I didn't understand what was happening. And what was happening was the uh, acid was etching them, and it was just getting rid of all the grease. So that's one of the things I really like about SaltCon is it leaves all your protection in place and doesn't harm your equipment. That's a big question I get all the time. Absolutely. And so that's that's kind of where I was going a minute ago. And this is a perfect question for you, Julian, since you know the technical aspect and you're a captain. Like I was saying, I have a little tower on my boat now, and I'm just picturing, you know, starting from the very top, I have a little, you know, Garmin unit up there. I'm talking about just starting spraying up there and spraying bow to stern and top to bottom. Is there anything that you can spray that you don't want to spray or vice versa? Is there anything that this can harm and or vice versa? That's a great question. And that's uh, one of the main reasons uh, I love salt going is. The first thing I do is just kind of from the beginning is flush your engine because you want to flush it while it's hot, right? And we want the salt on to go in first because once that cold water starts hitting it, the thermostats kind of start shutting your engine off. And then just like Patrick said, I start at the front and go to the back. And the powder coating is great, but you'll get those little nicks and stuff in there. And if you're not oh, using yeah. uh, salt on, that'll, that'll corrode you over time. But no. Any ceramic coatings, and this is ICAST, we were getting so many questions about this. People are using really nice ceramic coatings. They're putting things like C-Deck, and people are coming to us and saying that the acids in the other products were kind of eating the uh, adhesion, the, you know, the uh, glues they were using for the C-Decking. And then when they were putting an acid on their ceramic coatings, it was etching it. And salt gone being a totally neutral pH, you could spray it on anything. So my screens... Um, you know, all my bottom machines, my radios, any of that stuff, uh, any wraps you have, they're totally safe to use. And that's really our niche in this field that you can spray it on anything and it won't harm it. And then the other, Zach and I are always kidding around. We're always talking about corrosion, but we have to put some really quality soaps in the product. And man, it just really makes your boat pop when you're done. So you're kind of protecting everything and you're making it really clean and you don't, you cannot do it all in one one fell swoop and you're on and off pretty quick so yeah you can spray it on anything and not have a problem butch awesome so <clears throat> real quick everybody you know kind of probably keeps hearing this ph neutral thing and uh just to touch on it you know briefly why 
why it's a deal. So salt and water have the same pH, right? They're, they have a pH of seven. And so traditionally speaking, when people have wanted to uh, attack salt, they would generally use a low pH, like an acid or a high pH product. And the idea behind it was always to change one of the physical characteristics, the salt, right? So if you make salt not have a pH of seven, it will no longer be salt. That is accurate. The problem is, is that you just can't use it everywhere, right? Hey, that's a great way to flush your motor. But if it gets on my electronic screen, I'm going to see that mark there forever. So Mm -hmm. on the technical, the coding side, kind of where the product came from, if it didn't have a neutral pH, it would have never passed paint inspections, right? It would have never been able to kind of be this prep. And so that that's a, a big part of, you know, kind of understanding, uh, I, hey, I don't even have ceramic coatings on my boat. Why do people keep talking about this neutral pH? You know, this is what's allowing it to get on your electronic screens. This is what's allowing it to, you know, get everywhere on the fabrics on your boat, on your bimini tops, on your seat covers, right? This is what's allowing it to go everywhere. You know, just understanding a little bit of how salt and how water work, you know, it it really is unique to be able to do that with a neutral pH product. Very cool, man. Hey, Zach, I was going to ask you, um, you know, on the product, it says that it's a, you know, a salt eliminator plus a protectant. And I've noticed that since using the product, it seems like washing the boat becomes a little bit easier. Like the stains don't stick as bad. How is that possible without us having like waxes or anything like that, that are, you know, that would help to try to repel stains or am I just dreaming and thinking that, that something's (laughs) happening is really not. (laughs) Yeah. So what keeps stains on our boat is surface tension. Right. And so uh, when people talk about wax, talk about ceramic, they don't oftentimes like picture really what's, happening okay so whether it's wax or ceramic you know when you look at the paint or parts of your boat imagine it under a microscope and under a microscope it's going to look just like a piece of sandpaper there's going to be a bunch of peaks and valleys and when you put ceramic on there or wax or anything else you're filling in those peaks and valleys with a hydrophobic product something that repels water and that's why you get that sheeting effect and so what happens over time, we walk on it, we hit it with deck brushes real hard. We, you know, we, we essentially abrade that surface. Mm. And so what begins to happen, uh, you know, over time and kind of what you're seeing is you're preserving the protective coatings that are on your boat, right? You know, you're, you're not having to scrub it as hard. You're not doing the things that damage the surfaces. And so they're working better. They're working how they're supposed to. You're not going backwards. Exactly. Does that make sense? It does make sense. You're not going backwards. You're, you're, you're keeping what you have and preventing that deterioration. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Exactly. So what you're seeing is just, Hey, what I've got is just working better, (laughs) you know, And, (laughs) um, uh, and, and that's kind of what the goal is. Absolutely, man. I'm all about that. Well, guys, thanks for uh, joining us today. It was great to see you. We always like to tell our listeners, you know, where to find you guys' product. What's the best place to go and get more information if you guys have some resources online or social media? Where would you point our audiences? So, of course, you can visit saltscon.com. Uh, we've got all of our products on there. Everything ordered before 2 o'clock Central Time is going to ship out same day. You can give Jeff Bezos a little love and get us on Amazon. <laughs> and then you can, of course, follow us on you know, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, we're all over the place. Awesome, man. Like I said, we appreciate it. Julian, it was always a pleasure, man. Nice to see you guys again. Really enjoyed speaking with you guys. Thanks y'all so much. All right, guys, that was a very informative segment from Zach and Julian over at SaltsCon. Let's take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Richardoni Family Dentistry. You're going to need a good dentist, so you may as well make an appointment with fellow angler Josh Richardoni. He provides services for all ages and accepts most dental insurances. Do not let an achy tooth ruin a day on the water. Call today to book an appointment at 251-342-6672. And also brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available at select restaurants and can also be purchased by the public at Bon Secours Fisheries, Inc. and Ahi Seafood in Fairhope, Alabama. Call for availability. From a simple, nutrient-dense appetizer at home or a shucking party with friends, Admiral Oysters will steal the show. 
Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. All right, Captain Patrick, let's head on down and talk to our buddy Blakely Ellis over at CCA Alabama. Welcome back to the show, Blakely. How are we doing today, buddy? I'm doing good, fellas. How are y'all? Good, man. Did you finally recover from ICAST? I think so. I don't know. It's still, <laughs> that thing's like a tornado. You, you show up and you're really excited, and then you kind of like, you do a dosey day, and then it spits you out the other end and with a bunch of business <laughs> cards and some <laughs> emails. And uh, yep. it's uh, the work just begins when you leave there, you know? That's a yep. fact. That's a fact, man. Well, fishing's heating up. I know you guys have a lot going on over there in Orange Beach at the CCA Alabama chapter. Tell us what's coming up. Yeah, so we've got our uh, Orange Beach chapter, the lower Alabama chapter. has got their uh, their in-person fundraiser, the beach party, and it's going to be next Saturday, August 20th at the Wharf. Uh, we've got a new location at, on that property there. We're going to be at the, it's called Heron Point, it's the building, and it's over kind of to the east side of the marina. It used to be the Outfitter Center. It's a re- really nice property, beautiful building, really cool space and that event is going to be like i say saturday august 20th from six to nine and uh tickets are uh, 130 dollars for a couple and 90 dollars for a single that includes a uh we're doing a big old shrimp boil uh with all the fixings and then a full bar and beer wine and each of those includes the 12 month cca membership as well sounds like an incredible deal man what kind of good goodies you got this time Man, we've got a lot of good stuff. I've got uh, some some stuff that I'm that that that's a result of that, this last trip to ICAST, like those uh, those turtle box portable speakers. Those things are really slick. It's like the uh, the Bluetooth speaker of all Bluetooth speakers for boats. You know, they're waterproof down to like four or five feet. The, the guy said they they held a uh, held a weight to one, zip tied it, and held it underwater for for 24 hours and pulled it up, and it still it still worked and and functioned and all that. So it. <laughs> It, that's awesome. they, they do float so that's why they have to sink it to the bottom and uh so if you're looking for uh some extra tunes on your on your vessel if your stuff is kind of blown out already <laughs> don't want to fool with it this may be the route to go so we're gonna have some of those yeah lots of good stuff you know boat board has a lot of uh inflatable products now some um so i'm gonna have the full lineup of all that that good stuff for raffle and silent auction items you know a lot of the stuff y'all come to expect from us with uh, our partners like sims and Iowa. we're gonna have uh, tons of great artwork. Uh, we're gonna got we're gonna have good trips to like the Chandelier Island down to Cabo. Some opportunities to do some some hop on some of the um, some of the research trips we've got coming up to uh, with South Alabama for our uh, bull red study and uh, and some flounder studies. So if you've been kind of watching Captain Rutland and uh, Dylan do some of their flounder studies, um, we're gonna have a very unique opportunity to get you on the boat with them so those are some of the fun fun things we've got lined up and then uh like i said it'll be a la- live auction raffle and silent auction sounds like a pretty good event there pretty, uh, good lineup, pretty good food yeah. pretty good drinks pretty good prizes i'm all about that yeah all all the way around yeah. well well-rounded event well uh, i got a question for you we started something back in the uh the the beginning of summer Send out a few redfish or a uh, with with blue tags. Uh, what's going yeah. on with that, man? What where where are we at in that program? So there's still about four weeks left uh, for the tournament, but we do not have a winner yet. Uh, so we we still have just the two two anglers who've caught and reported uh, the blue tag redfish. Um, and that last one we had was back in gosh, it was before the Fourth of July. So we haven't had we didn't have any fish caught and reported in July. So that, that Nautic Star uh, Bay Boat package is still up for grabs. Um, and all you have to do to, to enter that tournament is to uh, to go on the Fish and Chaos app and you can sign up that way for $75 or you can go through our CCA national website and sign up that way. But um, the uh, the cool part is, is no matter what, somebody's going to take home that, that boat package. And so um, when the tournament ends on uh, Labor Day Monday at 5 o'clock p.m., if we do not have a certified winning fish caught, then everybody that had enter- entered the tournament will be eligible for that drawing, and one of them will go home with that boat motor and trailer package. And I bet so, that person, I bet that person will not be going to work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Blakely, that that's the part I've been trying to drive home with people here here recently. There, you know, the conversation is. Well, you know, the tournament started here and it ends here 
and the first person mm-hmm. to catch the blue tag redfish wins the boat. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, if you buy the ticket now or one day before the event ends, and the mm-hmm. and whether you catch it or you don't, and nobody catches it, we get to the drawing at the end. Someone that entered into the tournament is winning that boat. So yeah. that's I think that's, that's right. what we need to. That's the message we need to drive home. Even if you've never caught a redfish before in your life, go ahead and buy the ticket and be be ready. Mm-hmm. That way, if it if if we don't get a blue tag redfish caught, then someone's winning the boat that bought the ticket. Yeah, I'm gonna win that for sure. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, yeah. I thought I was I thought I was already <laughs> the shoot, but I mean, I'll make you whatever. a good deal. I'll make you a good deal. You'll make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you're right, and uh, it's and it's, your odds are getting better and better at this point. I mean, yeah, like so. Even if you want to play the play the odds and uh, try to fish for it this last month, and then uh, knowing that the odds of uh, of it converting to that that giveaway at the end of the summer, you know, try, give yourself a shot at, at you. You might end up catching that fish before it ends, but if you don't and nobody else does, then you still got a, a just as good of a shot to, to take them that package. And so it's. It's pretty good odds. I mean, we've got we're up to around 400 participants, so uh, one one out of one in 400 odds of winning a $65,000 boat package for a $75 investment. That's yeah, I'll take that. Pretty good. That's, that's cheap, man. That's cheap, and that's what I I guess that's <laughs> what I'm getting at is is you know we have listeners. I've talked to listeners that live in Pennsylvania and in Indiana and in Illinois mm-hmm. that may not have a chance mm-hmm. to come back down, but you know, mm-hmm. it's real easy to jump on Fishing Chaos and buy the $75 ticket and be in the drawing in case if this fish isn't caught. So yep. I, yep. I, I don't yep. know. I, I just think I, I think it's a no brainer to be involved in this drawing. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Yep. 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 For sure. Uh, you got a sec. I'll give you that, um, that text code for people that want to purchase tickets or look at the silent auction stuff once we get up, it up in a couple of weeks. But um, absolutely. You can text. Uh, at, LA two zero two two to the number seven six two seven eight. That'll that'll send you a link uh, to to get tickets or sponsorships and all that good stuff. Awesome, buddy. We appreciate you being on. We appreciate you being a sponsor of Great Days Outdoors, Blakely. We'll talk to you next time. Yes, sir. All right. See you later. Man, just to wrap up those two segments, that was a really cool salt gone thing, man. I I think it sounds like an absolute no brainer, especially somebody you know living on the water or have their boat on a lift or somebody that. I mean, really just anybody, obviously somebody that uses it every day, like you, it's definitely a no brainer, but I mean, I just, I I feel like I wash my boat more than I fish on it whenever it's sitting down there. On, on the <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just to keep, you know, crap off of it pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. Uh, it will, Especially we where live, we live. Good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we live in the salt air. We, it's, it's just, it, it's just part of, part of life around here. You know, I, I, I reached out to Zach after uh, hearing him on the Tom Rowland podcast and got set up with uh, with Salt's Gone on as a uh, brand ambassador. Nice. And, and uh, man, it's been a perfect product for me, especially at the, it, it was a perfect timing because I was, I was taking on, I took on a new blue wave and I got to start with a very, a brand new fresh vessel engine trolling motor electronics trailer everything and man i mean the the minimal amount of corrosion and rust and everything on this boat is just amazing and it's it's a hundred percent because of this salt's gone uh, because it's the only thing i've changed about the way i'm doing things so it's right. it, it's really it's really pudding. cool proof is in the pudding but if um if anybody is interested in buying that product if they want to use the promo code i've got a 10 percent off and you can use promo code ugly underscore fishing and if you forget what that is and you forget what the underscore button looks like you can go on my website and we've actually got a link on there as well on my homepage at uglyfishing.com very cool man thanks for sharing that yes sir all right, Captain Patrick, we'll head on down to Orange Beach, Alabama. Let's head to Sam's Stop and Shop. Let's see what Chris Vecce is up to. We hadn't had him on the show in a while. Welcome back to the show, Chris. How are we doing today, buddy? Man, I'm doing great. How about you guys? Not too bad, man. What you been up to? I know it's been uh, interesting weather, to say the least. You've been getting wet. You've been dodging storms. What you been doing? 
Uh, a little bit. My, <laughs> my wife would, my, my wife would definitely, um, you know, this morning we hung out underneath the pier for a little while to hide from lightning. So she would, <laughs> she wasn't exactly happy about that, but she just kind of laid back and I just kept fishing. So that's all you can do. Yep. Well, what you been chasing? Tell us a fish story. August pretty much, you know, I've, I've tried to get out a couple of times, got out front for tarpon and it's just been pretty rough on, on any average day. So I've been pretty much sticking on the grass flats and chasing redfish. I mean, that's been the been very consistent. Uh, the water conditions have been inconsistent. Um, you know, if you, if you hit it on the incoming tide, first thing in the morning for a couple hours, you get some pretty clean water. Um, man, when that tide switches, though, and goes outgoing, that water is absolutely disgusting. And the thing about it, though, is it, it, it doesn't necessarily shut the bite down, but I'm mostly doing a lot of sight fishing right now. Once that turns, you it, you don't know that redfish is there until you're about to run them over. All right, Chris. I've been doing a little bit of sight fishing in my neck of the woods when uh, when the weather allows and everything. And some of the redfish have one minute. They seem to be like really wanting a fin fish type of lure. And then another minute, they're wanting something like maybe a shrimp or a crab imitation, something smaller profile, something a little bit more creature like my like and i can't put my finger on it why why one versus the other because like every time i'm seeing redfish i'm seeing finger mullet and i'm seeing crabs and potentially shrimp and i'm not i'm not figuring it out until until i get the refusal and then i switch over to a different bait and then maybe get one to bite tell me a little bit about what some of the lures and some of the tactics you've been using on that sight fishing that's actually a pretty good point you just brought up because so first thing in the morning over here, and I'm throwing both a uh, little bit of spin and tackle, a little bit of fly tackle. First thing in the morning, I'm catching them on topwater, topwater hard baits or topwater flies, all bait fish oriented stuff. And they're chasing bait fish. I'm watching them chase, um, I would say finger malt. They're not even finger malt. They're like, they're like two inches long. Um, and then, of course, they're chasing uh, what looks to be little uh, LYs, you know, sardines. But once that sun comes up, if I, I can throw bait fish oriented patterns all I want, I won't get them to eat them. Every now and then I can get one to eat a jerk bait. But after after that sun comes up and they're sitting on the grass, especially if they're laid up, if it doesn't look like a crab, they're not eating it. Hmm. And um, I pretty much have been throwing one bait, and that's the, um, I don't know, if, I know I've mentioned before, but like the bugs lures, the permittal bug. Yeah, if I, if I put that on one of those redfish in one of the potholes or grass edges, they're going to eat it almost every time. But if I throw any kind of soft plastic, anything bait, you know, it looks like a bait fish. They, they care nothing for it. It's just, it's just crazy. Same, same fish, same groups of fish early morning, you know, top waters, uh, shallow diving, like wake baits have been absolutely wrecking them. And then once that sun comes up, I can throw that same stuff and they don't even pay attention to it. Hmm. That's crazy. I was just thinking if a jerk bait would work in that scenario. It should, it absolutely should. And you know, every now and then I can get one to eat, like I've been throwing that Rapala rip stop, and every now and then I can get one to eat if I just thump it in the bottom, like right in front of them. Sometimes I can get that reaction strike, but nine times out of ten, they they absolutely don't care about that thing. But if I put if I put the little bugs lure on them and just lightly feather, I mean, I'm barely working it, just lightly feathering that thing through the water in front of them, they'll come up and eat it most of the time. That's very interesting. That- Man, it's so interesting how we're in two different systems and the t- like almost the exact same behavior for these fish. That's yeah, pretty man. wild. And uh, can't take the redfish out of the redfish. They're going to do what they do. They, they're going to do what they do for sure. They are going to do what they do. That's right. What else you been chasing? Uh, I've been getting in a few trout mixed in with the reds. Really not many trout, and I, I blame that probably on the salinity more than anything. I did get a really nice one this morning. It was probably about I don't know, about 21 inches or so, but that was the only trout I caught this morning. You know, pretty much that, the jacks. Uh, you know, if I, I've launched down Fort Morgan a little bit over the last two weeks, and the jacks have been real consistent down there and a little bit easier to get into in Orange Beach and in Perdido Key. You know, they, they kind of come in waves at random moments across the, the flats. And uh, like this morning we had a, a small group come by us, but they were out of casting range. And I was in a no motor zone, uh, so I couldn't get on them quick enough. But you got to be quick on them when they, when they come across the flats over here because it's, if you're not in range, by the time you 
by the time you get on them, they're already gone, basically. So, but there's no well, flounder, uh, flounder on those same grass edges, occasional pompano, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. There's little surprises for sure. Um, my wife was throwing a wake bait this morning uh, on this on this one point we fish a lot over in Big Lagoon, and uh, she actually had about a four foot bull shark, you know, come chasing after it, and uh, luckily it didn't grab it because I'm pretty sure we would have lost that wake bait had that happened. But <laughs> yeah, right. Well, Chris, before you go much further, I want to go back to the jacks. I don't know. You've been what catching you're some seeing. giant jacks. I've been seeing your Instagram. They've all been, yeah, they've been XL. Well, that's what I was about to ask you is there are certain areas where we're catching like some showing off hammers, some 20, 27s to, to 30 plus, but I've seen more fish in Mobile Bay this year that are in the teens, like 12, like 13 pounds to to 19 and 20, that's 21 that's a perfect pounds. perfect size. And man, yeah, the fun, they, the they, fun are, size. they are. They <laughs> are. <laughs> they are really the fun size, but I've seen more this year all along Fort Morgan Peninsula, all up and down the eastern shore, even some on the western shore. And I was wondering if you've been seeing some of that, some of that in your area, or, or if it's just kind of a weird Mobile Bay thing. Yeah, I've seen some like 12 to, 12 to 15 pound fish in Mobile Bay over here on the flats in Orange Beach. They've all been absolute giants. You know, and you, you've been, y'all have fished for them long enough to know, you know, when most people give you the estimates on jack sizes, you need to take it with a grain of salt. If you, you know, if you put those fish on a scale, they usually disappoint you. What you thought was a 30 pound jack is probably 19, 20 pounds. But the ones here, the ones here that have been shut up on the flats and in the uh, bayous over here in Orange Beach and Perdido Key, I mean, they've been legit like anywhere from 24 to probably, uh, there's some fish that are in the low 30 pound range. They're all, I mean, I guess I could say they're all the fun size. These just uh, give you about 10 to 15 minutes more fun, I guess. What's funny about that is I feel like, I think it was last year about this time, we were talking with Bama Beach Bum, and we were all talking about how we wish there was more of those fun size fish around here. I don't remember if that was you, Captain Patrick, or not, but I can definitely oh, remember yeah. talking about that probably this time last year. Yeah, normally. Right, normally yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah. Well, and the, and the reason I say normally – I'm looking for that, but like this past weekend with uh, me and Cooper fishing the Condi Rodeo, I caught way more 22 to 24 pound jacks than I care to to have to catch. <laughs> trying to <laughs> trying to find that trying to find that fish that's 27 and 28 pound or or any anything over 27 pounds is kind of my target whenever I'm tournament fishing. And man, my my back's still sore from, I from bet. having to to fight the quote unquote fun size. <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've fished uh, the West coast of Florida a lot, Tampa Bay, Crystal river, um, that whole stretch pretty much between the two. And down there we catch tons of two to eight pound jacks, you know, a ten, realistically a 10 to 12 pounder is almost, I'd almost say it's bigger than normal. You know, a lot of them are the smaller size and it's, it's kind of funny how in some places you, you don't have the giants and in other places like, like here, it's hard to find that that fun in between size jack. And you know, most people don't most people don't appreciate them to begin with. Guys spend thousands of dollars to go chasing giant trevally, bluefin trevally, all these other species of jack all over the world. And we have <laughs> we have a world class right jack yeah. right here. And and people, it's it's like if you really break it down, like um, let's compare it to all right, let's look at a billfish for example. You know, it's like you know, they're, they're kind of flashy, they're colorful, they fight hard, you know, they're, they're aggressive. It's, and, and you usually catch them and what do you do? You let them go. And mm -hmm. so here you have a jack, which to me, a jack is a beautiful fish. Uh, they look mean as hell for one, which is mm. awesome. They love hitting top waters. They fight like hell. And then you let them go at the end. Yeah. That, that sounds terrible. That's a trash fish. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that, that brings up a great point. Uh, you didn't tell us what you were catching them on, Chris. What you, what's your favorite thing to throw at those jacks? Uh, definitely a big popper. It's too fun to catch them on top water. And especially if you find them, if you find them on the flats or you find them in those shallow coves, you know, a lot of time it looks like a boat wake. You know, there's no boats around, but suddenly there's just <laughs> this wake getting pushed across the shallow area. And if you put that popper in front of them, most of the time they're going to eat it. And it's, it's too fun watching them fall all over it. There's, there's days like if we're really targeting them on fly and we can't get them within range, we'll throw a hookless topwater. 
and they'll start chasing after that top water and you get them in range to throw the fly on them. I like throwing that hookless popper on them, even if we're not throwing flies. That <laughs> it's just fun watching them hit that popper. Plus, sure. you don't go through quite as many uh, morning workouts as you would if it had hooks. <laughs> Absolutely. No what about you, Cat? What's your favorite? Man, I've always been just kind of the opportunistic as far as me personally and for my customers. Just like whatever we can do to get one hooked up. But man, I'm really dialed in on the popper mode this year and uh cooper got in on some popper action man we had like he had have like That's six of stuff. them six of them just just crawling all over top of one another trying to get to that thing man and it was it's as equally as impressive to watch as it is to be a part of and being the angler on the rod um, i'd rather not so, be so much fun <laughs> <laughs> so much yeah, fun yeah. You know, you see social media, you know, of course, it's going to blow up, especially the surf fishing pages. A lot of people are going to post pictures of uh, a big jacks. And, you know, one of the things when people come into the store, everybody's always asking me which which poppers, which this and that. It, those fish do not care. Um, nope. You know, the main thing is, does it make noise? If it makes noise and it throws far, it's doing the job. The main thing is you want you want something that has good hardware on it. Um, you know, you want decent hooks, decent split rings. Otherwise you're going to lose a lot of fish, uh, from that. But you know, the probably most popular in this area is definitely the Halco Rusa popper. The new Yozuri mag popper is actually probably become my favorite because it casts further than pretty much all of them. And that thing stays stable. Like when you're chugging it along, it doesn't want to tumble out of the water as bad. It stays level and it, 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 it stays real stable. And that's, but like I say, it doesn't matter which one you throw them. Just make sure it's got a big cup on its mouth, you know, on the front of it. Makes a lot of noise and throws far and has good hooks, and you'll catch jacks on it. Well, Chris, I'm going to ask you one thing on that. So buying the, the rooster popper, they come with treble mm -hmm. hooks. And I've had um, my buddy Chris, uh, Sam Glass, he, he likes – he's su highly suggested to me to swap those things over to, uh, to single inline hooks. Oh, absolutely. So what's what what's the hook for that? I use the VMC inline singles. Um, I've also had some luck, you know, over the last couple of years, and I kind of kind of got this idea from um, guys that throw stick baits in Australia, the Indo Pacific, and stuff for GTs and stuff. And it works really well. But I actually, use fist hooks like you'd use on a um, on a butterfly jig or a slow pitch jig, hmm. and oh. actually loop those loop those onto the rings because they kind of free float and it's amazing how well those things work and because they freely swing with the fish uh you you almost never pull hooks on those um, oh it's, that's it's a great incredible. idea that is a great idea yeah it works really well works very well that's a fantastic tip very cool man i know that it's just not an offshore report necessarily but I, I assume you've kept your finger on the pulse over there i think we were talking a little bit earlier before we started recording we got we got to get out on the escape on Friday and Saturday, and man, I thought that Friday night was going to be on fire. We went pretty much straight south of Dolphin Island over there in that ditch, and got there, and the water really wasn't what I expected. I thought it was going to be a little better, but we put the lights out, and it was some pretty good life. We were running, you know, I think we were at like fifty or sixty percent waxing, and I just thought it was going to be on. I thought that the August moon, you know, up until the full moon was going to be just on fire and we didn't even get a whack uh you heard anything about that uh the sort by i mean there there were some fish caught this week like waxing crescent moon is usually my i mean that's ideal in my opinion uh Dude. especially on daytime fishing but nighttime as well and i mean yeah you definitely have to look you can get obviously different apps um you know follow your lunar tables and know when your you know when your major feeding periods are i'm gonna be having i'm gonna have bait soaking regardless of that but yeah, I mean, sometimes you're just either you're not in the right area or, or who knows what. I mean, it's just part of fishing, unfortunately. I know the tuna bite was a little slower from what everybody told me. Um, I only got I got offshore Sunday, and all we did was get beat up all day. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was with some customers at the store and a little bit smaller boat, and it was we just went out and did some bottom fishing. Ended up staying a lot closer than I in, intended. So, uh, you know, as I wanted to get out and try to troll for some water and stuff, we didn't get to do that. But, you know, the, the tuna bite, I know some fish were caught, you know, in the in the ghetto, as we call it, you know, Ram Powell, Marlin, Beer Can. Uh, There's some fish caught at the Marlin, but it was, it's been a lot slower this past week than it was, say, the week prior. Right. The week prior, it seems like a lot of fish were caught out there in close. A lot of, you know, 
60 to 80 pound, you know, kind of that perfect size fish. Um, and then quite a few mahi as well. Uh, the fads off to the southeast, you know, they were producing. They're now in some pretty seriously ugly water. So until, you know, until some conditions change, I wouldn't expect too much to come from over there. But, you know, there was still some dolphin caught in them, even though they were in just straight green water this past weekend. Yeah, yeah, that's why we went sword fishing. We heard the, you know, tuna bite was not on fire. So we didn't waste the fuel. We just kind of stayed a little bit closer and tried for a sword and then, you know, hit the scamp snapper thing on the way in but i was just curious as to what you thought on the swordfish i thought it was going to be good too man it was sad i was looking forward to some sword steaks you know it happens and like think of how many times you've been offshore anybody who's been offshore any amount of time has seen you know you pull up on a big weed line or a big rip and it's just epic looking it's everything you ever dream of finding when you go offshore fishing and you troll it for miles and miles switching baits and all kinds of stuff and you can't buy a bite sometimes it's the conditions are perfect and your hopes are up and it just doesn't happen. Yep. Yeah. One of the ingredients happened. aren't right there for some reason. That's never happened yep. to me. I've always, <laughs> <laughs> always whacking them. <laughs> yeah. Patrick's every, time, always whacking oh, every, man. every time I see the perfect scenario, the fish always bite. <laughs> and we'll have there to get might. that recipe from there you. We'll have to get that recipe from <laughs> you. Yep. Yeah, I don't know right. about the recipe, but I am going to go get my waders on. <laughs> That's right. Get deep in here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. We appreciate that report. It's always good to hear from you, Chris. If folks want to come down there and uh, pick your brain at Sam's, what's the address and the best way to get in contact with you guys? Yeah, address is 27122 Canal Road. We're about a mile um, mile past Dock Seafood on Canal Road, Orange Beach, down on the left. Uh, or you can give us a call at the store at 251-981-4245. Appreciate it, buddy. We'll talk to you next time, man. Be safe out there. All right. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, it's always good to hear from Chris Veche over at Sam Stop and Shop over in Orange Beach, Alabama. Let's take a quick minute and check out a few of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by AFTCO, American Fishing Tackle Company. AFTCO's fishing clothing is designed to handle the harshest elements. From cold tournament mornings to the humid summers of Florida, their products are built to handle the extreme. They're proud to hear customer stories about the 20-plus year-long life cycle of their AFTCO products. Their passion for the outdoors goes beyond their products. They're committed to protecting their fishing resources and angler rights. Through their 10% pledge to protect and conserve, your purchase of any AFTCO product directly supports conservation initiatives. Visit AFTCO.com. That's A-F-T-C-O dot com to learn more. And also brought to you by l and Marine. l and Marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats, pontoon boats, to bigger bay boats and offshore hybrids. l and Marine LLC prides itself on its customer service and knows how important it is to have someone you can trust and to be taken care of. They are locally owned and regularly support the community. l and Marine provides superior customer service and has an entire team that consists of professional sales members, finance experts, service technicians, and a knowledgeable parts and accessory staff to support you. Go visit their friendly, reliable, and experienced staff now located only six miles north of I-10 at 34600 Highway 59 in Stapleton, Alabama, or give them a call at 251-937-1380. All right, man, let's get our inshore report from old Captain Patrick Garmson with Ugly Fishing. Tell us a fish story, man. What you've what you been up to? Well, I shouldn't say it's the adult category. It's the open, just the open format of the rodeo. And then they have the junior version of it, anybody that's 15 years and under. Uh, so I was like, man, I, I really need to have them in both because I also entered up myself as a team and and um as team ugly fishing in the jack category so i needed a partner so i had cooper as my partner on that and really you know this time of the year i'm i'm such an opportunistic fisherman i don't i don't really hone in on speckled trout i don't hone in on redfish i or whatever that's what I love about a rodeo type format on a fishing tournament in the summertime is that dang near anything that swims is a category of fish. Yeah. 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 So it really makes fishing fun. It makes the the whole weekend an enjoyable time. And, and especially now that the Condies went to get on, now they're on fishing chaos and we can keep up with the leaderboard there. I think their scales open at like 10 AM on Saturday. So you can start seeing, Believe it or not, you can see and understand the trends of a tournament based on the first couple hours of a tournament being open. 
Hmm. I see it with the big rodeo. I've seen it with the Condies and other tournaments where you can kind of see where the trends are. If there's a big, if there's some big heavy speckled trout weighed in early on, on the first day, then it's probably going to be a really competitive category. But if you see like one of these more, I don't know, say like sheephead is something that I, I strive for. I, I love targeting sheephead throughout the year. And that's one of those car- categories that sometimes people struggle to get into. And we saw it pretty early in, into the weekend that nobody was getting into it. There was one entered kind of mid midday or late day Saturday. But anyway, I guess kind of getting off on a tangent here. But, I mean, that's that's really what I do summertime fishing just try to really take what you know the conditions give me uh we've got rain every single day since like i guess we had we had august august was in june and now we've got (laughs) rain (laughs) and now august is is june anyway it's 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 i don't know what it is but it's wet kind of backward summer and a lot of rain but anyway all of that being said is there's constantly changing conditions, whether it be wind or rain or whatever. And, um, you know, and, and Cooper and I, we fish several of these tournaments together. We fish different things together. And man, there, there's one thing I've learned about that kid is he likes to have his rod bent and he, <laughs> he likes to have the drag pull. Yeah. So we entered into the jack category. We did some jack fishing Saturday, and the jack fishing was really, really good Saturday. We caught a lot of jacks. We caught them on top water. We caught them on live bait. We caught them on dead bait. Uh, but we caught a lot of jacks. My back is still sore from from all of the jack fishing that we did. How are y'all but, targeting? Were you we uh, doing shrimp boats or just looking for them, running and gunning? Uh, what was your strategy? Well, early they were they were we were on the Eastern shore and they were just blowing up, just feeding on big uh, pogies just everywhere. And we start, and I started noticing a pattern where they were kind of coming off the end of this bar and circling around. And I ended up just sticking the power poles down and we could wait on them to come through. They were coming through us. Hmm. So it, it was a little bit aggravating to watch them blowing up out of out of casting range and, and there was a part of me to just get on the trolling motor and keep chasing them down but i was confident in my decision to pull down where we did and have the fish come back to us and it happened several times and in amongst waiting on the jacks to come back there were actually some big sail cats around and that's probably cooper's number one or number two favorite fish to catch <laughs> is the daggum snot shark Hey, uh, so we kept we kept uh, we kept some pogies off, and um, we kept them out in the water. And occasionally, it, the uh, the catfish would eat. And I think first, I mean, pretty early in the morning, he had one that was pushing five pounds, which is, you know, in tournament standings, that's that's, that's usually one. something that's going to be able to be, be, you know, be close into place. If not, if not, you know, a second or third place fish. So we had that one pretty early, and and the jacks we were catching were all in that say 22 to 24 pound range so they weren't the right school of jacks once they kind of calmed down we we moved off and i had a plan for redfish like i was invested more into red fishing this weekend than pretty much anything any other fish species and we went the entire weekend without actually even boating a redfish wow so some of that had to do with Probably, actually, most of it had to do with us just kind of pushing it, pushing it a little too hard. We were trying to sight fish some of these fish. We could see them. We were making some bad casts. That not not just Cooper being nine, but me as a guide and being on a rock lot, I was still making some bad casts. So we yeah. were we we as a team kind of sucked it up red fishing. And then we did we did end up finding some jacks on some shrimp boats and really had a blast with that. We were we just kept going fish after fish after fish and and got into some 27, 28 pound fish. And once once we start hitting that level of fish, and I'm weighing them with a boga grip, so I feel 
you know, I'm feeling 95% certain on what I'm looking at on my, as right. far as w- what my weight is. And, and I'm turning them loose if they're less than 27. And we, uh, we ended up settling in on some 27, 28 pound fish and we ended up making it to the weigh in on Saturday with a pretty respectable mess of jacks. Um, I think Cooper had a first and a third and I had a second. And that was kind of the trend was he was always doing better to me and everything he did this, this past weekend. And <laughs> that ain't he, all bad. Uh, no, no, man. I'm very, very proud of him. Well, let's talk about tackle a little bit, man. I know Jacks are, they're just beasts. They're hell on tackle. Um, you're talking about releasing some of these fish. So I would assume you're using something with a little bit of beef to it. What's your, what's your go-to setup for these guys? Yeah. So if I'm trying to catch them, especially in a tournament setting where, uh, I, I, I feel pretty certain I'm going to have to catch a bunch a, and release a, a bunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 10 or 12. I mean, obviously I'd love to only have to catch three or four, but or one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll, you know, that's the funny thing about Jack fishing is I love catching them, but at the same time, I, I love to not have to catch a whole bunch of them if I don't have to, but amen. anyway. Um, yeah. So I'm using, uh, I'm using pretty substantial tackle i use uh spinning reels uh in the 6000 size laced with 50 pound braid is is generally big enough leader it with 60 80 pound test and and really it doesn't as long as your leader and your braid match in strength you're fine uh the main thing is is i like to go up to like that 80 pound test just because i'm going to be catching fish after fish after i want to change a leader every time yeah yeah and a jack a jack's going to chafe it up a little bit seven alt eight alt big circle hook something that's that's got a you know a lot of strength that you're not going to bend and then a rod i'm the rods i'm using are loose i think they're like seven foot and they're rated like 50 to 80 pound test or or 30 to six uh, something like that but anyway i i want to be able to try to fight that fish as hard as i can possibly fight it break its spirit and get it in the boat within i I like to try to think i can get them in under five minutes that's my target if i can get them in in three minutes or more or less perfect because Ultimately, we're trying to cull through these fish to get to the point where we're able to have something that that is a, a weigh in quality fish. So, sure. Whenever you're putting that much pressure on a fish with that big of pound test, do you use a swivel or are you still using a braid to mono union of some sort? Yeah, I just go, I, I do a Alberto from my braid to, uh, to my mono, and that's it. Like, no swivel no nothing i just i trust that alberto to lock in place and i've i've never had one fail if 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 i did it right if it's if i did it wrong it's gonna fail really quickly right and um i was just curious that's a lot of pressure it bites in yeah i mean and i fight them to the i fight them as hard as i can like i'll i'll put my hand on the spool and not let it turn oh yeah and i'll just and sometimes it sometimes i have to let my hand off and let it just take (laughs) off but for the most part, I try to put as absolutely much, as much heat on them as possible. Most of the time, I'm just going to take my boga grip and, and lip grip them over the side of the boat. Once I bring them boat side, put a weight on them, pop the hook out. If it doesn't make weight, dump it back in the water and go back and get another one. Now, if, if I'm a little skeptical of, of me to be able to grab it one-handed or whatever, then I'll, we'll scoop it up, put it in the net bring it bring it on in the boat and then weigh it and then let it go right but yeah man that's uh um it really is a lot of fun a lot of my customers enjoy doing it i would say probably in the last three weeks or so we've we've been harassing a bunch of them and you know i have customers all over the country that come fishing with me and that's something that they can't get anywhere else (laughs) you know you're not going to go fresh water and find where you can just go and catch a fish that's mad enough at at life to want to try to pull you overboard. <laughs> that's <laughs> and, true too. And, that's, and that is what a jack is trying to do. Uh, they're they're literally going to try to pull you overboard. What else you been doing? Outside of that, uh, as far as to finish out the weekend with with Cooper, we were um, 
one of like I said it earlier, one of his favorite things is is going and and chasing those snot sharks, the old uh, the sail cats. And we on Sunday we gave up red fishing again. On you know we gave up two days in a row without a red fish. We were running down the bay and I saw some birds just kind of circling and I felt. I felt like we were going to be around some jacks or bull reds or something. Not that the bull reds would have mattered in the tournament, but it's fun to catch. Mm. And I just stopped the boat. Cooper threw out some pogies, and he instantly starts catching. Excuse me, he instantly starts catching sail cats that are pushing into the six pound range, which is in a tournament setting. That's that's a really big sail cat. So he goes like three in a row. I'm fishing as well. I'm not catching anything. Finally, I catch one and it was like four pounds. And I just, Chris was, uh, Chris Veche was on talking about, uh, I don't know if we had it on air or not, but he was talking about making fun of me about calling my cell cat. We had the cell cat selfie. Yeah. And so I just put it on my Facebook as my new profile picture because so he owes you a dollar now. Yeah. He owes me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyway cooper loads the boat with just these massive sail cats and then we we move on to an area that i felt good about you know maybe catching redfish sheephead you know ground, even a ground mullet would have been an option in this area and uh a few fish in he catches a little over nine pound sheephead which is an absolute monster any time of the year and especially especially in the right now yeah. I personally have never seen a nine pound sheep head in the summertime. And it was, it was like, I mean, I, I'm still beside myself to think that that happened, that he got that fish and got it on a tournament day. It's his personal best. You know, he's never caught a sheep head that big and he called That's it on awesome. a tournament. We kept it alive, took it to the scales, weighed it in. He got first place to round out the whole tournament discussion. The kid took first place in sheephead, first place in sail cat, second place in sail cat. That was in the uh, in the open board, which anybody, all adults, kids, anybody can be on that. And then in the junior category, he had first place uh, sheephead, first place sail cat. He was tied for master angler on the on the main board. Uh, lost it due to the uh, the rules of the tournament on you know as far as the tiebreaker is concerned, which you know, perfectly understandable, Sure, but the condies is really cool. So they have a option. They have a, um, a top male angler, top female angler and Cooper got top male angler. So it, That's at awesome. nine years, at nine years old, got top male angler for the year, uh, with the condy rodeo celebrity. I don't know, man. He's, you know, I'm a, he's, he's my son. Uh, I like to brag on him, but he's, <laughs> he's been, <laughs> He's been showing out in these tournaments here lately. Sounds like he's a shoe in. But anyway, outside of outside of that, man, um, like I said earlier, this is the time of the year where I'm real opportunistic. If jacks are blowing up, I'm targeting them. Uh, we're starting to run into some bull reds in in some of these areas where uh, you have some estuaries dumping out or some rivers dumping out, and the pogies are getting super super thick in these areas. And uh, there's some bull reds starting to show up pretty good in, in some of those areas. I saw some of those pictures of some giants you caught. So that's every a, that, that, one of them. Yeah. Huge. The, the, yeah. The one you're talking about, they were, I think every single one of them we caught that day were over 40 inches. And my this, standard, my standard as a guide is like anything over 40 inches on a redfish is like quote unquote trophy status. Absolutely. And then the jack anything over anything that's at 30 pound and better i mean those are those are trophy status fish in my opinion and yeah so all the redfish were over 40 inches it's just unbelievable do you guys um, just look into those or were you kind of looking for them like you said you no know, now's a good time to get those yeah so big girls with the pokies coming out of the tributaries but what were they biting on and, and how did you find them i think every one of those fish came on top water wow yeah so we were coming through an estuary. We, we, I liked this time of year. I just like to have pogies on the boat. So through the cast net, caught some pogies and we were, we were leaving, we were headed out 
And then I see a fish blow up and I was like, man, that, that sure looked like a redfish right there. So we turned around and we stopped, I gave the guys some top water just to see what would happen. And uh, within just a few minutes, we had our first one on that was right at 40, maybe 41 inches. And that's a screamer on, right there on top water, man. I mean, and, and it, and the thing ate his top water, like a rod length away from the boat, man, <laughs> it was epic. unbelievable that's cool but so much so much fun uh these the, all of these fish we take good care of them we got some good pictures we tagged them take some time to revive them make sure that they're going to swim off good and strong um that's one thing i'd like for under, people to understand the guys that, that that do target these fish or accidentally catch them however whatever the case may be just take some time with these fish especially right now in the summertime with the water being hot Make sure that that fish swims out of your hands and not just throw it back in the water and hope it hope for it to do its best. Right. Uh, because they just they just ran a marathon in a sprint. You know, I mean, they they had a lot of they had a they had a really very strenuous strong fight. Yeah. It was a very strenuous yeah. fight. I guarantee um, you if I put a seven out seven out hook, you know, around my neck and then took off running with 18 pounds of drag, I'd be passed out in about 30 seconds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed. I would need some revivation exactly. for sure. Exactly. I mean, it's probably the exact same thing that the I would drag think so. fish is feeling. Yeah. But <laughs> so yeah, just take some time, work on the fish. And I always tell my customers, because I like to a lot of a lot. I like for them to actually have the opportunity to let the fish swim out of their hands. I just try to put the fish in a swimming motion. You want the fish to be moving into the current, whether you're moving the boat or you have current flowing by your boat, just having the fish facing into the current and yeah. giving it a swimming action. So the whole entire body of the fish is swimming, right? And then that means that their gills are working properly everything's doing what it's supposed to do and then as soon as that fish is to that reviving point you're gonna feel it it's gonna kick and it's gonna take off and you're not gonna see it again it, it's gonna swim off and it's gonna do its thing and you know hopefully you'll be able to enjoy catching it again you know in days to come or, or all or of its babies to- yeah absolutely Catching all of its babies for years to come. That's right. Agreed, but, man. Um, what else? What man, else did we cover? What I, else you been doing? So today we um, today we went red fishing and we caught a bunch of nice white trout. <laughs> I I went to an area that I was felt really <laughs> good about catching some catching some slot red fish and you know I think we had one hooked up and it ended up breaking us all. Uh, but we had. Uh, everything that came on board were like really nice, like probably three quarter of a pound, a pound and a half white trout. So made for a, a made for a nice mess of fish for my customers today. Those things um, are fun to catch too. They hit like a freight train. It's uh it's very unusual or very strange how hard that they will hit, but really then is. a lot of times they kind of, they kind of give up on the way, on the way to the boat, but it is fun to, as hard as they do strike but i haven't really done a whole lot of speckled trout fishing we've been catching a few here or there we've been doing some deep you know reef fishing and stuff been doing some shallow water fishing uh but man this is the time of year where there's so many different species that are at our fingertips and, and that we can that we can target and enjoy and that because they're not going to be here for another couple of months and uh once they're gone you know we're waiting until next summer so yep. um I like, I like to I like to harass the speckled trout once it gets cooler and less fish are available and that's my that's kind of my my mo. Yeah, that's one thing I enjoy about your reports and just talking to you in general is like you say opportunistic. You just catch what's biting and there's always something always something biting here on the Gulf Coast, man. It may not be you know your favorite species or the you know the glorious species that everybody always gets caught up on, but man, there's always something to catch here and it's fun. I tell you one thing, the the one fish that got away today, besides we did have one, I feel like a red fish that it broke us off. My customer had a absolute monster ladyfish hooked up and it nice. was it was acting up and and it came off and and I was aggravated because I have <laughs> I've now become like 
fascinated with trying to get these great big ones in the boat because they they really are a challenge to get into the boat yes they um are. i mean they do poop everywhere so you gotta as long as you know to grab them where their where their poop shoots gonna be pointed to the, the water other way that's right <laughs> <laughs> then uh then they're a lot of fun but i like to put them on the boga grip and see what kind of weights because we have this year in particular we've had a couple of them tip the scales over three pounds and man wow there there's not a lot of three pound fish out there that fight anywhere it's like a near it's like your baby tarpon and they're they're crazy they they jump they and they do and, flips and, and they they flip they jump you know you're over here you're facing all you're off the starboard side of the boat and all this the next thing you know the dang gum things Way under the boat there. on oh, the yeah. port on the port side in like in in a matter of a half a second so yep. they're they they're, are um, they're they're amazing and um a lot of people don't give them credit where where credits do in my opinion they are they are a lot of fun they tear up your line you got to retie your leader after you're done but man yep. they're they're a cool fish in my opinion Yep. Yes, they are, man. Well, congratulations to Cooper. That sounds like a really, really cool tournament. Congratulations to you as well. I know you guys Appreciate fish it. hard and enjoy fishing together. That's really cool to see folks want to get up with you and book a trip. What's the best way to get in contact with you? Man, the easiest thing is uglyfishing.com. You can go on there and click the book now button. You'll be able to see all my availability. In addition to that, I've got some guys that I'm trying to help keep, uh, keep some trips on their books so if you just need to get out got some customers need to get out or whatever the case may be and i'm booked i can get you set up with somebody else just shoot me a text is the easiest thing at 251-747-1554 but anyway all the information's at uglyfishing.com we appreciate you giving the report and we appreciate you taking care of our listeners man we look forward to hearing from you next thanks sir all right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. That's an awesome inshore report from Captain Patrick Garmerson with Ugly Fishing. You guys take a quick minute and check out a few of this week's great sponsors that bring you the podcast for free each week. That segment was brought to you by Alabama Marine Resources. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who harvest gray trigger fish, greater amberjack, or red snapper that their catch must be reported through Snapper Check. This includes vessels, kayaks, and shore anglers who possess any of these reef fish. Reporting is mandatory and must be done prior to landing fish in Alabama, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report to Snapper Check online at outdooralabama.com or through the official Outdoor AL app. For more information about Snapper Check, please visit outdooralabama.com. Com. And also brought to you by United Bank. United Bank knows what an important role agriculture plays in our local economy. At United Bank, they are here to support local farmers with financial products and services designed specifically for agribusiness, including real loans for farmland, equipment loans, working lines of credit, and more. Truth is, they deeply value the contributions agriculture makes to our communities, and they help our local farmers build successful businesses. They want to see you succeed. Learn more at unitedbank.com or stop by any United Bank branch. United Bank, all loans subject to credit approval, equal housing opportunity lender, member FDIC. All right, Captain Patrick, you know we got to do what did you learn before we get out of here today, man? What did you pick up from today's show? Oh, man, I really, I really like chris's tip on using that tandem assist hook for those top waters for the something jacks. i never really considered but it makes a lot of sense man it makes perfect sense i do not like treble hooks like i'm trying to get into to this single these uh inline hooks for top waters and i've and i've had success with them for sure but man this this right this idea right here just really sounds like the absolute perfect scenario for for jack fishing and just throwing those big poppers and just having and having the hook stay in place because now all of a sudden they're they've got some they've got some uh, free range motion there between between the hook and the lure versus um versus being fixed because a lot of times i do lose fish on treble hooks because you know they're it's so rigid from the lure to the hook it'll pry their you, mouth exactly you yeah. you just kind of wallow that out and uh man i really like that tip what about you dude yep i definitely picked up on that too it's something that i'd never really considered and man treble hooks they they're first of all there's a lot of hooks and i'm always 
<laughs> I'm always befuddled that a fish can actually hit one of those things with two or three treble hooks and not get hooked. It blows my yeah. mind. Um, yeah. So if, you're, if your hookup ratio doesn't suffer by going to an inline, then wh why would you not? I mean, they're safer for you, safer for the angler, safer for the fish. So it's definitely something I'm going to try. And I'm sure it'll be like anything. You know, you'll have to just kind of play with it and figure out which scenario, which setup, as far as the tandem assist hook works, works better. But it seems like I'll be working in the long run. Mm -hmm. Man, salt's gone. Uh, it seems like an absolute no-brainer. I'm definitely going to use your discount code. Thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, I'm going to get some, man. Like I said, I wash my boat a lot, a lot more than I would like to. But it seems like... If you're going to be doing it, why would you not be doing it as good as possible? And Zach really broke it down as far as, like you were saying, you know, why does this seem like it's actually putting wax on my boat? Well, it's not necessarily, but it's not taking it away either. That's right. Makes great that's, sense. That's, um, I'm telling you right now, the the boat washing process for me has just been so much, so more streamlined. I barely ever have to break out any other soaps or deck cleaners or anything like that. Like I, I really like the, uh, the, the star bright non-skid deck wash. I mean, I use it, I probably use it like twice a month now, whereas I used to use it, I don't know, probably three times a week. I mean, and doesn't that, doesn't that, can't that strip your wax though? Doesn't the star bright, the, can it strip your wax or am I wrong on that? That particular product, no, it, gotcha. it doesn't have it like, and it actually adds a layer of protectant down as well. But the, what I'm getting at is, is using the salt scone product. It just loosens everything up and it, and it takes it away. And I don't, I just don't have the stains stick around like I used to. And, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, man. I, I just can't go on enough about how, how I think Zach happy did a, I am for making that for making the purchase of that product. For sure. I think Zach did a great job about breaking it down and telling us how it actually worked. And that's, I mean, you can't argue with science, right? You can't. Well, I mean, there's probably some science you could argue with, but I, I like his science. It works. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I, bet Joe, I bet Joe would argue with it at some point. What Joe wouldn't have anything to say, <laughs> but it works, man. It it's um. I'm looking forward to trying that on my boat for sure. I've definitely been uh, like I said, I, I was being truthful. I've never really had a boat that I cared about that much, and I want I want to make it as nice as possible for as long as possible. And it sounds like a no brainer, really. Yeah, and I'm and I'm in a situation where I turn my boats over pretty regular, and the less corrosion, the less rust, the less any type of stuff i mean it's it's just better for me in the long run because make you more I'm, money yeah then i'm passing a product on to someone that's you know the boat looks that much better right as despite, pristine as possible yeah despite the use that i put them through so it's yep. it's a no-brainer all right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. Let's take a quick break and check out a few more of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Do you need a new roof? Do you have wind or hail damage? You may qualify for a free roof. Foster Contracting will inspect and provide you with an estimate, stress-free, and they will handle your claim with your insurance. Your roof is your first line of defense this storm season. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your day. Foster Contracting has you covered. Check them out at www.fortifiedroofingpros.com or give them a shout at 251-447-2978. All right, Captain Patrick, it's always a pleasure whenever you co-host with me, man. Thanks for joining me today. Dude, absolutely uh, my pleasure and always enjoy it. I know you uh, got off the water and ran into the studio today to uh, help me out. Our uh, our big headed friends got a little little illness. He could not join me today. Joe was supposed to join us for the Salt's Gone segment, and uh, we wish him well as soon as possible. But I'm glad you got to join me today. Hey man, no problem. Joe gets a little he he's kind of a softy from time to time. So yeah. what are you gonna do? Nothing, man. We just, just gotta, gotta bail him pick, out when you can. We just have to pick up his slack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please make sure and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to text the word fishing to 314-665-1767 to get that free AFCO Sun Protection Mask promo code and also to be added to our email list. And we'll send you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. Be safe out there.
This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Test Calibration. Test Calibration is your source for sales and service of diesel turbochargers and fuel injection systems since 1976. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. And also brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. They offer high quality, easy to use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection and also brought to you by Fish Bites. Whether you are hitting the sand with a set rig using the traditional scent strips for pompano or fishing the flats or marshes for speckled trout, redfish, and flounder, Fish Bites has something for you. Fish Bites baits and lures are made with pride in the sunshine state of the USA. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at fishbites.com. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by me, Joe Baia, and National Land Realty. If I can help you in any way with the purchase or sale of land in Alabama or Florida, whether it's timberland, farmland, recreational land like hunting land or even agricultural land or ranch land like horse farm drop me a message at jbaya at nationalland.com that's j-b-a-y-a at nationalland.com and also brought to you by killer doc killer doc uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun killer doc combines durability function and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience visit killerdoc.com to see more and also brought to you by boaterslist.com if you own or run a boat, you know how difficult it can be to find the right company for the task at hand. Sign up at BoatersList.com to find a company to work with on your next boat project. Also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. And also brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing charts since 2004. Your source for sea tips, altimetry, currents, and watercolor at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256 442 2588. 